Um, the question here today is the making of China policy. First, I want to echo something that uh, Tom Christensen said earlier. The legacy this administration will leave to the next president, regardless of who that president is, is a good legacy. It may have been a rocky start. It may have began with anything but Clinton. But after a long, and, a long process, I would suggest that our U.S. policies in Asia or relationships with China are on a very good track and indeed being left to the next president, perhaps better than any president has left his successor. So we are in good shape. Having said that, for me to talk about the making of China policy with the other panelists in this room would be a clear mistake. There are others in this room who know the inside mechanics of this process far more than I. They've served on the, in administrations. They've served in Washington, of course, beginning with Tom, but the members on this panel as well. So what I'd like to do something a little different today, rather than talk about the executive branch and how policy is made, is to talk about how American policy has changed over time, how policy reflects the rise of China. And we have seen policy change. We have seen evolution of American policy. And not all of it simply reflects who the cast of characters are inside Washington, inside the executive branch. But some of it also reflects how China is changing, how East Asia is changing. And I want to do this in, with regard to security issues. We're all familiar with the rise of China and its impact on the American economy. We see this every day. But we talk about the rise of China, but there's very little attention to, well, if China is rising, and has already risen considerably, well, we should see change elsewhere as well. And I believe we're seeing change on a daily basis in East Asia in the security order and in U.S. policy toward China and U.S. security policy for the region. Now, I want to talk about this with respect to, to a number of issues in East Asia. I want to talk about this with regard to the Korean Peninsula, how the rise of China has affected American policy. I want to talk about this with regard to Taiwan, how American policy has affected been affected on Taiwan by the rise of China. And I want to step back and look at the region as a whole. How has America's broader security policy for East Asia reflected the rise of China? Now, first, let's begin with the Korean Peninsula. Now, often we talk about the rise of China. We don't ask, well, how do you know it when you see it? Where is the rise of China? Well, in the Korean Peninsula, I think we see it in three areas. First, we see in economics. Of course, in this country, we're familiar with the economic impact of the rise of China. But it's being felt far stronger, with far greater impact on smaller countries on China's periphery, with strategic and political implications. In the year 2000, that was the year that the Chinese market became more important to South Korea than to the United States. We became number two. Because in that year, there were more South Korean exports to China than the United States. And in, when you work in the realm I do, if you are an importing country, that means other countries depend on you <coughs> for exports. And that means they depend on you for jobs, GDP growth, and ultimately political stability, which meant that in that year, 2000, China was more important to South Korea than the United States. And that trend has just grown and grown over the years, and I would suggest over the next two or three years will grow even more. Same thing with investment. South Korean investment in China is just taking off. But we also see it in military, and this we see it in, in two respects. One, Americans, when we look at the rise of the Chinese military, we care about the Navy, the Air Force, aircraft carriers, submarines, Soviet aircraft, Soviet-era aircraft. But if you live in, in the Korean Peninsula, no, you don't care about Chinese Navy. Even the Air Force is of minimal importance. But you're focusing on that 1.3 billion population and that 2.5 million uh, military and what it can do. And this is not Mao's ground force. This is a far more focused, capable, technologically advanced, better trained, better educated, better funding armed forces on the ground. And if you're South Korea, that's what you care about. And third, in that same context, South Korea is living under the shadow of unification. Hasn't happened yet, but that shadow is already factored into contemporary policy. When will unification take place? We don't know. But we didn't know when the fall of the Soviet Union would take place either, and it was very quick. So it could be in a year, it could be in five years, it could be in 10 years. But South Korea has to think about that future today. What does that future mean for South Korea? It means a common South Korean border with 1.3 billion Chinese. And overnight, when that happens, your South Korean strategic environment will look like Vietnam's strategic environment. You have to think about Chinese power very differently. What are the implications of these changes for, for the United States? Well, first of all, in, in my field, if one country is rising, we talk about relative rise, that means the United States is, is, is inevitably less powerful. And indeed, our ability to defend South Korea from the economic and military <coughs> costs of conflict with the Chinese has reduced. Does it mean we can't win a war? No. 
but our ability to defend South Korea from the cost of conflict has reduced, and that in turn compels South Korea to adjust to a new reality. And how is it doing this? Well, it's accommodating Chinese interests. The United States has turned to many of its allies under the Bush administration and said, with transformation of American doctrine, we were asking our allies to do new things. We want our allies to contribute to our ability of our forces to go anywhere, anytime, to fight wars under any contingency. That means American forces in South Korea may not necessarily be there to defend South Korea. We want South Korea to help us use these forces for other scenarios. South Korea said no. They said no because they understand that that scenario could involve a Taiwan conflict in which South Korea would be expected to ally with the United States against China. And they have refused diplomatically in various kind ways, but we've yet to reach an agreement on strategic flexibility. Second, South Korea has asked the United States to end the joint military command whereby U.S. general controls South Korean forces in wartime. <coughs> Third, managing North Korean proliferation has been very difficult because South Korea has often cooperated more with China than the United States both in terms of economic relations with North Korea and in terms of co contributing to American coercive diplomacy. All these three things are indications of a redefined security relationship. Do we have a very robust and cooperative relationship with South Korea? Absolutely. Do we still have um, a, a healthy military relationship with South Korea? Absolutely. Do we have an alliance? Absolutely. But these are critical changes that go into the making of a strategic relationship that you can have wartime cooperation and those that significantly eroded. What has been the U.S. policy response to this? We've actually expedited this trend. Perhaps not on purpose, perhaps it's not our intention. But U.S. force presence in South Korea is down 40 percent from as high in the Clinton administration or from the Clinton administration. We pulled our forces out of the area between the DMZ and Seoul. There is no more tripwire. That has the effect of signaling South Korea, on both cases, that we're less reliable strategic partner than we were. It may not interfere with war winning and war fighting, but it tells South Korea that maybe they need to cooperate more with China. We also see the impact on American policy on nuclear proliferation. We no longer bluster. We no longer threaten. There are no more nuclear crises on the peninsula as we threaten North Korea with war. Why? Because it didn't work. In part, it didn't work because South Korea undermined it every chance it had. Economic sanctions, a threat, have not worked because South Korea frequently would reach out to economic overtures to the North, just as the Bush administration was suggesting the opposite. We are living with the status quo. In part, we see this by a decision to work through Beijing. We don't act unilaterally anymore, but we have, in many respects, ceded leadership to China on nuclear proliferation. We work through Beijing rather than unilaterally. And we do so in a cooperative environment, which is very healthy, rather than trying to exercise military threats and coercion. But in so doing, we are implicitly saying that North Korea's evolution to this point in time, where they have a nuclear capability, is something that we may have to live with, because we are simply not have the ability to act unilaterally, and those in the region are unwilling to support more coercive policies. Will we continue to work and negotiate for rolling back their nuclear capability? Absolutely. Is this still an important policy agenda? Yes. But are we prepared to live with the status quo if necessary? Yes, and I believe that's a change. I believe we also see the rise of China and the implications for American policy on Taiwan. Now, how do we see the rise of China? Once again, it's like the, the Korean issue. Economically, 40% of, of Taiwan's exports go to the mainland. That's a huge number. 50% of manufacturing takes place in the mainland. That's a huge number. That means, in many respects, the Taiwan economy is as much a part of the mainland economy as the Canadian economy is part of the American economy. And the Canadian economy is anything but autonomous. We see it in military as well. There are now anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 Chinese missiles targeted on Taiwan. Are they first rate, high tech, pinpoint accuracy? No. Are they up to the 20,000 that we dropped on Afghanistan or, or, Ser or Serbia? No. 
but they have the ability to destroy that economy, destroy that political system because of political impact. And there is no defense against Chinese missiles. Latest thing I read, six, six minutes from launch to target, missile defense will not work in that strategic environment. Second, there's no point in even thinking about America assisting Taiwan in an anti-blockade strategy. Because the mainland doesn't need to carry out a blockade to strangle the Taiwan economy. All it does is shut Shanghai, Xiamen, Hong Kong, and the others unilaterally. Blockades are designed to interdict trade between an adversary and a third party. There is no third party for Taiwan. It's right across the street. What are the implications of this? The United States is less powerful than it used to be. Our ability to defend Taiwan from the cost of conflict in the mainland is drastically reduced over what it was 10 years ago. It's not a question, again, of whether we will win or lose. It's a question of whether we can defend Taiwan from the cost of conflict, and we can't. What are the implications? Taiwan, once again, has to accommodate itself to the mainland, same way South Korea has. The independence movement is all but dead. Look at public opinion polls. Look at voting outcomes. It's important to recognize that in every single election, since the first democratic elections were held in Taiwan, if you look at the aggregate voting, the DPP has not re received 50 percent of the vote in a single election, but one, following two bullets and then it got 50.02. Given that 80 percent of the population is so-called Taiwanese, one has to assume that these so-called Taiwanese, this 40, 40 percent of them are voting for the KMT, for some reason they're dissatisfied with the DPP in each election. And in part, that reflects independence issues. Who won the last election? Mine Zhou did. Ran on a platform of cooperation with the mainland, ran on a, po on a policy of opposing independence. And he said, in my heart, I want to see unification. It's not a policy. But the people in Taiwan voted for someone who said, I am personally for unification. Even if it's 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. Taiwan identity, now that's an important one. It's you know, multiple definitions of identity. Taiwan identity, mainland identity, or mixed identity. It's been very hard for people in Taiwan to maintain a Taiwan identity when your entire future, your family, is wrapped up on the other side of the street. Your children go to university. Your families are growing up there. Your sister or brother, they live there. Your future career opportunities are across the mainland. Hard to treat them as the other, the outsider. And the, as a result, we see Taiwan mainland dual identity growing, which, of course, to the extent that identity drives independence, undermines the demand for independence. We also see this in defense ties. The Bush administration approved a very robust arms sales package for Taiwan in April 2001. It took six years for Taiwan to finally put forward a request. Party bickering, first one side's the obstacle, then the other side's the obstacle. The important point is the voters didn't really care because there's a growing awareness on Taiwan that weapons can't help defend Taiwan. They're dealing with a rising power 90 miles across the strait. And their situation is very similar to that of Cuba dealing with the United States. To spend money on high-technology high weapons, high-profile weapons, doesn't help defense. Indeed, to the extent they're buying weapons today, it's not be because of defending Taiwan. It's because it's leverage against the mainland, because the mainland doesn't like those weapons. Taiwan defense budget has been going down and going down and going down. Why spend on defense when you're dealing with the rising power? What's been the U.S. policy response? How have we adjusted? We've actually encouraged these trends in Taiwan's mainland policy. We've been highly critical of the independence movement, and implicitly, we were opposed to the DPP and Chen Shui-bian. Now, why are we doing this with respect to both Taiwan and South Korea? I believe we've heard the reason in Tom Christensen's talk earlier today, where Tom said American policy is to peacefully resolve this crisis. It doesn't matter who wins. That's been our policy on Korea as well since 1953. Peaceful resolution, we don't care who wins. What does this tell us? This tells us that our, our interest in Taiwan, our interest in the Korean Peninsula, is not the real estate. It's our credibility. We have said we will defend these countries from use of force, and we are committed to defending these countries from use of force. But should they decide on their own that they want a peace agreement, however it's reflected, 
That's their call. I would point out the difference between that and Western Europe during the Cold War. The French never had the options of joining the Warsaw Pact. <laughs> we are happy with these changes. We can live with these changes because this is peaceful resolution of conflicts over real estate that are not vital to American interests. And I would suggest these are all very good trends in American policy. We were accommodating very, very important interests of a rising power at almost no cost to American interests. This makes the U.S.-China relationship more stable. It makes Asia more stable. And it's hard to see how it hurts the United States. What about the rest of Asia? How has the rise of China affected American policy? Here, rather than seeing accommodation to China, we see a very robust American policy designed to maintain our capabilities. We see this in part in our relationship with our allies, strategic partners. The U.S.-Japan alliance has never been stronger. There's never been better cooperation. It's a strategic issue. The USS George Washington, one of our nuclear carriers, has now been able to call and home base in Japan. Major change. Japan is the most active cooperative partner anywhere in the world on U.S. missile defense projects. Japan is cooperating with the United States and Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a robust relationship. Parenthetically, compare this with South Korea. Singapore, we have a 75 percent base in Singapore. When Singapore went off and they built something, a port facility that can handle something the size of aircraft carriers. Well, who could that have been for but us? Interesting development in the Philippines recently. There was a humanitarian relief operation the U.S. Navy helped out, and we sent an aircraft carrier in. And the Philippine legislature you know, questioned this. Why was an aircraft carrier sent in for a relief operation? Because we want to begin the process of strategic cooperation with the Philippines. First time a carrier sailed in the Philippine waters since we left Subic Bay. Malaysia, Seventh Fleet calling at the Malaysian dock, the Malaysian ports in the Malaccan Strait up considerably by some reports that uh, the Mal Malaysian port can't handle more visits anymore. Australia. Northern Australia is becoming a major communication hub of the United States. High-tech communication equipment going in, becoming strategically more and more important. All of this is the rise of China, changing American policy. All of this is America saying, this is a part of the world we care about, and if we care about it, we have to do more because China is rising. U.S. deployments. It's, it's, it's not a, too much of an exaggeration to say that there is no more room left in Guam for American facilities, American equipment. Los Angeles-class submarines, F-16s, F-22s, B-1 bombers, SSGN submarines, cruise missiles, and a regional crisis management center. Now, of course, a regional crisis management center is a euphemism. What's the euphemism on? It's a wartime command center. This is all China. Defense budgets. Remember, we have two defense budgets. We have our annual defense budget, and we have our supplementary budget for the war in Iraq. That's not counted on the books of the defense budget. Our annual defense budget, the additional increments, that is, it takes a lot just to be in business if you're in the Pentagon, but to the extent that there's, to the extent that there's discretionary spending, much of it is China-driven. China is known as a budget driver within the Pentagon. Acquisitions. China drives it. We have to go to Congress and explain why a certain weapon system, you say China. So we see the impact of the rise of China on American policy change across the board. On the one hand, China is compelling policy change and accommodation, where the United States can make those changes, can make those accommodations, and do so constructively for our own interests and for the region. But simultaneously, it's also in the United States to reinforce its capabilities, reinforce its strengths, where the United States would rather not change and doesn't want to change. Thank you.